Uh, thanks for joining us for another seminar for the, uh, from the Center for AI Innovation at the University of Illinois and National Center for Supercomputing Applications. I'm Brendan McGinty, serving as your MC for the day, but also uh, part of the Center for AI Innovation. Really appreciate the fact that you spend for some uh, an early lunch hour, others a little bit earlier, like Wayne on the West Coast, our, our featured speaker. Let me introduce him. Speaker today is Wayne Miller, the Deputy Director of the High Performance Computing Innovation Center at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. He leads an exceptional team of scientists, engineers, and administrative staff in the Livermore Valley Open Campus, who support open engagement and collaborative innovation with the private sector. He and his team work with industry, government, and academia to foster tech transfer of high performance computing applications and resources to make game-changing capabilities broadly available for public benefit. Such world-class capability has clear benefits and ROI across the full spectrum of applications, including industrial design, drug discovery, and climate studies. Wayne works with technology leaders and in industry to solve specific proprietary challenges and engages broadly with industry groups on common issues addressing entire sectors of the economy. He also works with leading academic institutions to support collaborative R&D between faculty and Livermore staff and support student engagement through sponsored research and internships. In addition, Wayne works with strategic domestic and international partner institutions that complement Livermore's capabilities. Wayne has a long history of technical leadership and experience, including as associate program lead for renewable energy, thermal fluids group leader, and PI on internally funded R&D activities. Prior to joining Lawrence Livermore, Wayne designed wind turbines at Kinetech Wind Power and developed helicopter simulation codes at NASA Ames. Wayne holds a PhD in mechanical engineering from Duke University with technical emphasis in methods of engineering simulation. Wayne graciously accepted our invitation to join our center, our AI center's advisory board, as well as to speak today. It's really an honor and to turn it over to Wayne Miller. Wayne. Thank you, Brendan. Um, uh, Brendan and I actually share some, some professional DNA in our roles with industrial outreach from our respective institutions. And it was our pleasure Finally, uh, after a, a year of pandemic delays to get Brendan to do uh, the first of these reciprocal seminars, it was also virtual that he gave to Lawrence Livermore. So thank you for the introduction. Thank you. Um, so uh, um, when, when you asked me to give a talk, I did have to think about what topic I would choose uh, because as you may have guessed from, uh, from my introduction uh, materials, uh, I'm not a data scientist born and bred. I have a sort of diverse, background in engineering and simulation, but uh, no one can help but be uh, inoculated by, by data science nowadays, especially if you're working in, in the computing uh, domain as I am. So I, I thought what I would do would be talk a little bit about how we at Lawrence Livermore and the other national labs um, move technology from, uh, from, from, from the uh, germ of an idea uh, through proving the technology and then actually moving it into uh, an application space, space with, with practical outcomes. And that is the valley of death. You know, it's, it's sort of a catchy term, but you will hear it around the place. Uh, it's, it's, you know, when you come up with, uh, say, a new theorem in mathematics or, or a new chemical co compound that you think is interesting, uh, what are you going to do with it? How are you going to turn that into the next uh, billion dollar idea? And, and that, that chasm between uh, initial innovation and delivering you know, uh, a, a useful outcome, that's the valley of death. And it's a real thing. And it can stop great ideas in their tracks when you're looking at the development time and cost and moving something forward. So let me move ahead here. Uh, kind of broken this up into chapters. And I, I do have more slides than I normally would want to put into a talk, but that's because I want to give several examples uh, about uh, to, to illustrate some of these ideas. So uh, a, a quick uh, flyby of the national laboratories. There are 17 DOE national laboratories. Uh, Lawrence Livermore, Los Alamos, and Sandia are 
are considered national security laboratories. And we're managed by the National Nuclear Security Organization, NNSA, which is uh, a big program within the Department of Energy. All of the other labs, I believe, are managed by the Office of Science uh, component of the Department of Energy. And, and we are one of um, two, three, four, five, eight uh, multi-purpose labs, which means that uh, we stick our fingers in every pie. We have lots of different technologies that are actually important to our, our, our national goals uh, compared to some of the single purpose labs like uh, NREL, National Re Renewable Energy Lab, which is just what it sounds like, a renewable energy lab. That uh, would be considered a, a single topic laboratory. But this is the main campus. It's a square mile um, just outside of Livermore, California, which is uh, about 40 miles uh, southeast of San Francisco. It's a pretty nice place. So you're all welcome to come out here. Uh, about 7,000 employees. Um, the, the budget this year is about two and a half billion dollars. Most of that is for nuclear weapons work, which was the reason this and the other national security labs were founded back in the 40s and 50s. Um, but to do that, uh, we need lots and lots of science in lots and lots of technical domains, and that includes data science. Um, this is one incomplete way to look at our core technologies, but they do illustrate some of the key areas that we work in. Uh, bioscience, data science, material science, uh, I won't read every one of them, but at the center of that, uh, in, in the gold bonding, that gold banding there is HPC modeling and simulation. Every scientific domain that we work on uses as uh, a tool um, uh, computing, um, whether it's physics simulation or, or statistical modeling, or you know, more lately, uh, you know, developing neural network models of, of, of different processes. Uh, computing is central to all of these topics. And my organization, um, as, as Brendan kindly noted, uh, works with uh, the outside community, outside of our security fence to, to, uh, to uh, project that uh, capability onto uh, players in the US economy. My organization is the HPC Innovation Center and I won't read this again, every line for line, but uh, again, our role is much like Brendan's where we work with the private sector to uh, transfer some of our, our knowledge and capabilities uh, in any of those technical domains uh, using computing as, as a central tool. And when we talk to people about that, this is part of, part of the message that, um, when you add uh, big computing, uh, and you know there's a you underline and capitalize big, or at scale as we say around here. When, when you uh, apply uh, big at scale computing on a problem, and you do it uh, with an approach that takes advantage of that large scale, you can really make transformative changes in the kinds of problems that you're working on. And just to illustrate that, um, the Department of Energy contracted uh, a survey of the return on investment of, um, of, of applying uh, high performance computing to you know, uh, almost any uh, large scale industrial problem. And um, you, can, you can actually download the uh, report there at the URL on the bottom, but the, 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 uh, the quick bullets are, are the four there. For every dollar a company invests in HPC, they get $500 in revenue on return. For that dollar invested, uh, they, they get almost $50 in profits or cost savings. So the ROI by the way that this was measured is, is quite substantial. Uh, on the other hand, it doesn't come free. Um, a, a significant uh, HPC investment is about two and a half million dollars per institution. And it takes almost two years for major returns to start being realized from those investments. So uh, if you're in it for the long haul and you've got the dollars to put into it, uh, then, then uh, you're well rewarded, I guess is, the, is the, uh, the upshot of this study. Okay, now this was a late addition. Um, 
My organization, the HPCIC, is hosting the first uh, machine learning for industry forum this August. And it's so new that the website isn't even up yet. So this is a, a snapshot of the landing page. Uh, but if you'll write this uh, URL down, ml4i.llnl.gov, and check on Friday, I think it's going to be live on Friday. If not Friday, then within a day or two after that. And it's open to anyone. Uh, pretty much anyone to come and uh, listen to speakers and panels talk about how to uh, adopt a machine learning for, for almost any industrial challenge. There'll be a big focus on manufacturing for this first forum, but uh, it may broaden beyond that. So I won't say any more about that now. Okay, so what is this valley of death I was talking about? I've got two examples just to give you an idea how we've uh, bridged that gap in the past. Uh, the first one's one I actually had a chance to work on a few years ago. Uh, in bold there on the left, you see the quote that last year Apple's iPhone 12S became the first mobile phone on the market powered by a five nanometer microprocessor. And you remember from Moore's law that, that was it every year the uh, the feature size or feature content doubles. I can't remember exactly how Moore's law is quoted, but you know, chips get denser and denser as technology moves forward. And uh, they had gotten to the uh, density, the small feature size where you, you couldn't really print them any smaller because of the wavelength of light you use for lithography. So we worked with uh, uh, major uh, lithography uh, um, uh, manufacturer, uh, lithography equipment manufacturer, ASML, to create uh, extreme ultraviolet light. That's the uh, EUVL, which has a very short wavelength, which allows you to uh, print uh, finer feature sizes. And um, they knew the chip industry. And what we knew was lasers and, and plasmas. And so those are both critical to making this technology work. And uh, what's happening here in this very simple schematic is a laser is being beamed into a chamber and those black dots represent uh, droplets of tin that are the liquid tin that are emitted from uh, that emitter at the top. And that laser pulse hits each droplet, which is, you know, that's a, that's an exercise in precision right there. And if it's done just so, that droplet ionizes and creates uh, EUV light as part of the plasma that it creates. And then that EUV light is captured by a series of uh, parabolic mir mirrors and, and such. And then that's sent over to the lithography table where the chips are manufactured. Um, but uh, getting the, uh, the, the laser and, and tin physics right was a big challenge for that company and it just happened to be in our wheelhouse. And so that's something we worked with them on for about three or four years in order to improve uh, the understanding and, and the physics of, of that process of creating the EUV light. So that's example number one. Uh, this is example number two. This goes back to uh, at least the early 90s, microimpulse radar and I'll wager that everyone uh, listening right now has got a few of these on your car. Your backup sensors that tell you if you're gonna bump into the car behind you or whatever. All those little round uh, pucks you see on your bumpers are hiding one of these uh, MIR uh, microimpulse radars. And this was technology that was developed at the laboratory for a completely different purpose. It was to uh, instrument uh, fusion experiments where you're trying to capture uh, uh, events in the experiments that are happening at uh, what well, says sub nanosecond there. And so this was one of an instrumentation technology developed at Lawrence Livermore to do just that. But then you know, somebody said, well, aha, this has got many, many more uses uh, um, other than this rather esoteric uh, fusion experiment uh, data gathering. And they thought broadly and commercialized it and now it's everywhere. So uh, microimpulse radar is yet another example of you know, taking a technology and moving it all the way from the lab to, in this case, every car on the planet right now, pretty much. So those are examples of uh, uh, bridging that gap, moving uh, uh, 
um, a challenging technology from the lab to the field, uh, but they're not data science. So now I think we move into, oh, wait, I got one more topic to cover first, uh, cognitive simulation. Pardon me. <clears throat> this, I, I mentioned this because it's, it, it's, uh, it's, um, it's part of every ex example in data science that I'm going to talk about in a few minutes here. And uh, cognitive simulation is, it's, it's a known term. Uh, it's not something created here. Um, it, and um, I would simply say it is the intelligent combination of both physics simulation, like if you're doing you know, finite element modeling for a bridge or fluid dynamic modeling for an airplane, uh, combining that with uh, uh, methods of data science to, to come up with, with a, a hybrid solution, simulation solution that uh, is better than the sum of its parts. And it's pretty powerful and we're doing a lot with it. So this is the old school way. This is the way I grew up with. Uh, you take uh, experiment as your ground truth to uh, validate uh, simulations. And you work on your simulations, your physics simulations, to try to recreate that, uh, that, that trusted data. And th this actually works pretty well. Um, you know, uh, the, the better you get at refining your physics simulation, the better you get at uh, predicting whatever it is you're looking at, like turbulence over an airplane wing. So this has been going on since, well, since the 40s or 50s, I would say. And, and it still goes on now and, it, and it's still critical that this happens in order to, to gain confidence that you're predicting the physics right. And with the, uh, the uh, more contemporary interest in uh, using uh, data science methods pretty much everywhere, uh, it didn't take long for somebody to say, well, what if we combine all three of these together? We can do machine learning and experience, uh, experiment and simulation and let's just see what that does. And so uh, that's uh, what we've been doing a lot of at the laboratory lately. Um, we're thinking of this in, in using uh, data analytics and machine learning in um, sort of two, two locations in, in the simulation pipeline. <clears throat> Uh, the first one here is maybe the simplest one to, to understand. It's machine learning on the inside, as we call it. And that's watching the physics simulation as it runs to make sure that it stays on track. And, you know, you don't get the, uh, the divide by zero errors that make uh, people uh, get calls from, from the computer operations team at, at uh, 3 a.m. on a Sunday to say, your, your job just crashed our supercomputer. Would you come down to the lab and, and restart it, please? So um, an example of that is shown here uh, with uh, mesh tangling. If any of you are familiar with you know, using uh, meshes for uh, finite element methods or finite different methods, difference methods, um, the lower left image and the lower right images show a, a good mesh and a twisted mesh respectively. And this might happen say in a, in a turbulent situation where you're combining two different fluids and you want to keep a different colored mesh, in this case, on each fluid, at some point, they, they get so intertwined that the meshes that try to uh, resolve those two distinct materials get all twisted up, and that leads to the divide by zero error, the not a numbers. So we've uh, developed um, sort of machine learning tools to watch the uh, evolution of the mesh quality and to fix it on the fly as it happens. So uh, I think that's a pretty one, pretty easy one for an engineer like me to, to get their head around using machine learning on the inside. Uh, machine learning on the outside is probably where, more, uh, where it's more interesting and also a little more challenging to, to develop these hybrid methods. Um, in this idea, I think of, uh, in a simple way to say it, the uh, machine learning uh, components are like traffic cops that are watching what uh, your suite, in this case, a suite of, of physics simulations are doing in order to find, say, an optimal solution. And there'll be examples of this. That probably sounds quite vague at the moment, but there'll be some examples of this in a minute. 
Um, but you can imagine, well, let's just use optimization as, as a guide. Uh, if you're trying to optimize something, uh, you might use a traditional gradient base, based method to start from a, you know, an initial design guess and uh, sample uh, design spaces around that initial guess, look for a, a better design and keep marching in that direction. Uh, that can be quite computationally expensive. Um, and we've developed uh, these uh, machine learning observers to uh, sort of watch that optimization process and keep nudging them in, in the most profitable uh, directions, let's say. So it's, it's almost a replacement for a traditional uh, discrete gradient based method. So, okay, so that was what cognitive simulation is. And now I'm gonna give uh, four examples, four current examples of how we're trying to put all of this together. We're using cognitive simulation methods, uh, uh, generally interpreted, in, uh, interpreted um, and uh, data analytics um, with uh, several examples of working with, with uh, the private sector for taking these tools and moving them, you know, in this case, from the, the virtual laboratory and, and now into uh, uh, practical use. Uh, the first example comes from uh, heavy industry. There are examples from the left on uh, rolling uh, aluminum and examples on the right of creating glass. And the glass example on the right is the one I'm gonna talk about. And what that hot thing is, that is uh, a melt pool for glass, and that's sand on top. You know, you put, they actually just dump sand in this pool heat it to about uh, 2,500 degrees. The sand melts, mixes with a couple of uh, dopants and it flows out as uh, uh, pure liquid glass on, on the, uh, the, uh, the exit end of the pool. And you'll see a schematic of that in a minute. Um, so in, in manufacturing, there are many places where machine learning has been applied and can be applied and uh, uh, using vision to you know, look at uh, part quality, for example, uh, predictive maintenance to uh, understand when you need to take a system down in order to fix it before it fail, fails catastrophically. Uh, one we've talked about is um, uh, improving supply chain robustness. Uh, after the pandemic, there were so many disruptions in the global supply chain, but this is certainly a hot topic area. Uh, process optimization, how do you tweak that input or that output to make sure that uh, the parts coming off your line are uh, within spec the whole time. Uh, generative design, that's uh, getting into uh, the uh, design optimization I was talking about, and how do you minimize cost and maximize function? And, and then robotics, um, which is, you know, part of, could be part of a process design too, but robots need to have uh, their, their own internal decision-making processes to make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to do. All right, so uh, now we'll take a, a little closer look at that uh, glass production design, a glass production problem. This actually uh, came to us through uh, what's called the HPC for energy innovation. Uh, I'm not gonna put that in the chat right now because I don't have the chat window up, but if you just uh, search for HPC uh, four, the number four, Energy innovation, that's a, it's a long, long contracted word, I know, but HPC for Ener Energy Innovation, uh, you'll find the DOE website that covers this program. And what this does is it, uh, it solicits proposals from industry uh, to work with the national labs, uh, uh, applying uh, advanced computing to industrial problems that will have an impact on global energy use. And uh, this is one that we worked on for, uh, I can't remember the name of the company. I'll see it, we'll see it in a minute in, in a logo. What's going on here is this is a cross section through basically a liquid glass swimming pool. On the left there under the gas burners are where the sand is dumped into the pool. 
And if it's working right, you get these two convection loops going on. On the left, the sand is, is melted. Uh, it sinks to the bottom. And then that spring zone is actually, they send bubbles up that and that helps to lift up the uh, partially melted glass sludge back to the top. And then on the right uh, is, is a convection loop of the uh, fully mixed and melted glass. Uh, what's not shown there are, are links between the two because there, there is uh, a pathway for the uh, fully melted glass to get from the left side to the right side. And then finally, the, uh, the, the melted and uh, properly tempered glass on the right side to exit into the production lines. And it's pretty hard to do. And if things go wrong, if they have to turn off this melt pool to fix it, what do you get? Well, you get uh, a swimming pool full of frozen glass and sludge. And that costs a, a huge amount of uh, money and time. And uh, uh, let's not forget energy uh, to remelt all of this and, and fix the process. So we worked with this company to uh, predict the best process control parameters to keep this process running strongly. And in the end, it did work out really well. It works like this a little bit. Uh, my colleague, Victor Castillo, did this work. Uh, he started with the design of experiments, um, which lets you sample the possible design space there on the left to pick uh, the most, uh, most likely productive experiments from among many to uh, sort of bound and describe uh, the response space of, 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 in this case, the milk pool. Uh, they ran physics simulations, a few of those uh, based on that design of experiments study, combined that with existing experimental data from the manufacturer, and that created the training data set for a machine learning representation of this process. And then now down there on the bottom, you see uh, train a neural network with that output. And uh, the back half of the autoencoder is your machine learning tool that describes you know, inputs and outputs for, uh, for the glass melt problem. And turn that into this. It's, it's a little laptop app that lets uh, the uh, operator at, at the glass factory just change these little sliders on the top there, which are their inputs in order to predict uh, uh, what the state of the process will be for any uh, combination of, of the inputs. And uh, this is also predictive in that uh, it, will, it will suggest uh, the most optimal changes to keep things running. Uh, the company took this away. And as far as I know, they haven't had another melt pool failure since then. So this was a great example of working with the industry to take their challenge problem, uh, combine it with some additional uh, simulation data to enrich the data set and create a, a great outcome. Uh, PPG, that's who the company was. Uh, um, they were recently purchased by Vitro. So uh, this, uh, this table here just represents some of the savings that these uh, machine learning outcomes have created for industry, uh, mainly through this HPC for manufacturing program. So you can see you know, lots of terabytes and uh, uh, terabtus and petajoules of energy saved and, and uh, you know, uh, a million to, uh, uh, I thought there was a billion in there somewhere, I don't see it now, a million to half a billion dollars in, in, in uh, cost savings for these companies uh, if these tools are broadly uh, adopted. So definitely a payback. Okay, the next example is in um, uh, additive manufacturing, also done at the laboratory. Uh, AM, uh, or we call it advanced manufacturing, is um, a, a big effort at Lawrence Livermore as at many other places. And uh, one thing we're working a lot on is uh, powder, powder bed, uh, um, uh, laser-centered um, manufacturing. So this is an example of what's going on. This is a, um, 
you know, these parts are created uh, as a laser scans over the surface of a, a bed of a finely a fine particulate metal alloy, you know, powdered metals. Uh, the laser uh, melts them a layer at a time, and then the part um, sort of rises up out of the out of this bed uh, as each layer is added. <clears throat> and what this image is showing you is that uh, the laser strength, uh, you know, the energy uh, deposited has to vary depending upon the feature size. So if you're at the top of that arch, which is the lowest of the four red bars across the part, um, you see that there's a gap in the part. And at, at, that's layer 162 the, on the very bottom uh, of the, uh, the right half of the image there. You need to turn off the laser basically if you're not trying to create a part there. And as, as you move up, as that gap closes, you need to adjust your laser strength to uh, you know, start carefully um, melting and, and, and fusing the particles in order to close that gap at the top of the arch. We developed uh, two different machine learning uh, uh, tools that work concurrently to make this happen. Uh, the one on the left is a forward convolutional neural network and that predicts the photodiode signal. And, and the photodiode is is a diagnostic that's watching this process that shows you basically how hot your melt pool is. And that's indicative of uh, a combination of laser energy deposited there and also you know, uh, some, some, some information about the uh, topology of the part being designed. So that's predictive of, of what you want it to be. And then another tool, another uh, neural network tool starts with that and adjusts the laser strength uh, as, it, uh, as it goes forward uh, across that predicted path. And for an old school numerical analyst like me, I kind of think of that as like a predictor corrector kind of approach. It's not exactly right, but you get the idea. You want to uh, choose your best uh, path forward and then uh, choose your best way to cross that path. And so that's how these two tools are working together. All right, the last two examples are on uh, uh, drug design. So the first one is uh, uh, a cancer pilot that we work on with the National Cancer Institutes. And um, well, this is pretty cool. So uh, every cell has got, I think it's every cell, has got something called a RAS protein, R-A-S. And this RAS protein um, is Pretty simple in what it does, to, at least to say what it does, but quite profound in, in its effect on the body. It, it uh, determines whether or not a, a cell will, will, will divide or not. So if the RAS protein gets kicked on, on a normal healthy organism, the cell will divide and you'll have two cells. Uh, if it's turned off like it is for most of the life of the cell, it, it's, it's inert and the cell just does its cellular, cellular job. Sometimes with some cancers, the RAS protein gets stuck on, and so the cells just continue to divide, and that's a tumor. And so understanding how uh, this functions at the molecular biology level is fairly critical to understanding uh, how to develop therapeutics for a wide uh, variety of cancers. So um, our part of this uh, effort was to develop um, the, a cognitive simulation tool uh, that can be predictive of how this RAS protein behaves in, in uh, the presence of uh, you know, designed drugs, basically. Um, this is a movie, but I'm not going to turn it on because I understand that uh, with, uh, with, with uh, Zoom meetings and Cisco you know, WebEx meetings, it looks fine to me, but you see them at about three frames per second. So you're just gonna see this chunk, chunk, chunk. So I won't turn it on. I'll just describe what's going on here. Um, uh, this is a, a schematic of the uh, physics simulation of the cellular membrane where this RAS protein lives. I don't know what all the different layers are. I'm not a biologist, but they're important to uh, uh, capturing the, uh, physical biology at, at, this, at this level. 
And this is using a continuum simulation, primarily a continuum simulation, which is uh, inexpensive and not fully accurate when you're looking at say individual uh, uh, drug uh, molecular behaviors, but, but it kind of gets you close. So um, this uh, continuum simulation runs all the time uh, with, with different uh, uh, therapeutic uh, drugs in, in, this, in the solution. And uh, this AI traffic cop that I was describing earlier watches what happens and it tries to uh, locate different areas in this uh, sort of lower resolution continuum physics simulation that are interesting. And when that happens, oh, oh maybe you can, I don't know how that looks to you. But it, it, when that happens, it will identify an interesting region for, uh, for a drill down of, of, of resolution and accuracy. So it, it takes the uh, region around this, this one uh, molecule and generates uh, a very high resolution molecular dynamics uh, uh, solution of just that area. And now you can put your, your, your uh, predicted therapeutical drugs in there and look at things um, basically at the atomic level. So uh, you know, much higher resolution and you're not wasting this very expensive molecular dynamics simulation everywhere. You're only using it where it looks like uh, you're gonna get the, uh, the most uh, promising outcomes. Uh, this has been going on for about four years. It's still an active project, product, uh, excuse me, still an active project with the NCI and the Frederick uh, Cancer Institute. And then the last one I want to mention is also another uh, drug design uh, activity. This one's called ADAM, Accelerating Therapeutics for Opportunities in Medicine. And this is a formal collaboration between, uh, oops, that wasn't supposed to happen. Uh, this is a, a formal collaboration, a public-private partnership with uh, national labs, uh, university medical systems, uh, medical programs, and um, uh, private partners. The, the original founding partner was GlaxoSmithKline. I think that's covered in here somewhere. So um, in the abstract for this talk, I mentioned drug design as a perfect example of, of the valley of death. You know, it, it's relatively easy to come up with lots and lots of candidate drug designs uh, that you think might be interesting. Um, but, uh, you know, looking, thinking back to that, uh, that, that uh, Cancer Institute example, uh, testing each one of those, even in computer, is a, a really challenging project. Uh, so you don't test them unless uh, you really have some confidence that uh, they're going to get you where you want to go. You know, it could take um, could take a billion dollars and, and 10 years to take a potential drug candidate all the way through trials and, and into, you know, uh, through FDA approval. So it's not, it's not something for, uh, for, for the timid or, or, or a week apart to go after something like that. Uh, nonetheless, it has to happen. And uh, well, since uh, many of us are getting vaccinated right now, fortunately it does work, and, um, uh, but, it, but it, nonetheless, it's still a challenging problem. So this ADAM consortium, uh, Originally was GSK, uh, UC, uh, University of California, San Francisco. They have a really uh, uh, impressive medical center there. Us, Lawrence Livermore, uh, we do the, uh, the, the data science and computing for this and the Frederick National Laboratory for Cancer Re Research. Um, they actually have a campus in San Francisco on the wharf. So if that's the kind of job you'd like to have, you could give them a call. Maybe you could live on the on the, on the coast in San Francisco. And this is for, uh, for our talk, this is kind of what goes on here. What's happening is that we, we created a, a pipeline for uh, drug design and testing in the computer. This course doesn't take it all the way through human trials, but it gives you the confidence uh, in, 
and your drug candidates that uh, would, would let say GSK uh, commit to the resources to, to finishing that. So there are two tools here. There's a property prediction model tool, uh, which uses a, 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 a variety of uh, machine learning uh, approaches to uh, predict what a, what a design candidate would, how it would react. You know, is it, is it, is it poison? Is it curative? Is it um, just, just completely inert? So you can uh, quickly go through uh, a screening of lots of potential candidates with this tool. Um, and then those uh, could then be sent to the lab for actual in vitro testing. Um, upstream of that would be uh, the generative molecular design tool, which is actually generating um, molecular designs of drugs. And um, so this is, again, if, if, if you think of, of that uh, uh, um, melting glass in the swimming pool, where you had a predictor tool and a corrector tool. I, I think of this kind of in that way. One creates the, uh, the drugs for testing and the other one uh, tests how that drug works, at least uh, in, in a data analytics uh, framework. And then um, the, the best options coming out of this pipeline uh, go on for further actual testing. So, our component of this, our part of this ATOM consortium was to create the, this modeling pipeline called uh, uh, AMPL, the ATOM Modeling Pipeline. And uh, you can see there, there uh, you can get the, uh, the manuscript and more information at those URLs in the bottom right if you're interested. Um, but uh, let's just walk through uh, this, this uh, process uh, flow here and how the thing works quickly. So data ingestion and curation, you know, that's the first step in te teaching any machine learning tool how to work. Uh, featureization is, uh, you know, sort of labeling that data in, in uh, domain appropriate ways. And then they train several different models. They call it the model zoo. So you could have a random forest, a neural network, uh, maybe just uh, other linear programming models. You know, a whole bunch of them, they're all competing to see which is gonna give you the best outcomes. Uh, then the prediction generation, which is predicting what the uh, efficacy of those drugs is. You know, th th those two, model training and tuning and prediction generation are those two machine learning tools you saw on the previous slide, and then analyze the results. So this is the AMPL pipeline uh, created for uh, identifying and initially proving out potential drug candidates. As one example, and again, I'm not a biologist, so don't hold me to, uh, to any deep uh, uh, discovery of what this means here, um, but let's just take a look at that uh, color chart on the right. Going from blue to uh, green to yellow to red, those represent uh, different um, different cycles through this process. And what this means is the more, the more refinement that this AMPL pipeline uh, has with drug candidates and creating new drug candidates, the better they get. And so they wanna get up into that green box in the upper left-hand side. And you can see as the, uh, as the maturity of the design cycle improves, uh, you know, the, the red is definitely shifting in the direction you want it to go to. And as one, one example of that, um, um, this was for uh, drugs, uh, how, how toxic are they to, to the liver? And uh, the best models from this AMPL pipeline are in the red, uh, the reds in the middle column there and the previous best models on the left. Um, I wish I could tell you the significance of what those decimals are, I don't know, <laughs> except just to say that they looks like they're getting better. You probably want them to get to one. And so they've got about, you know, uh, 10 or 15% improvement over the previous best models. And this was just done by, you know, setting up that pipeline and, and letting it run for a weekend on, on a big system. So it's definitely, it's definitely improvement over the state of the art, just say that. 
And finally, that's it. Sorry, that was a lot of slides, but I did want to exemplify as much as I could. And I think I'll stop there and take any questions. Wayne, thank you so much. It, a lot of slides, but a lot of the substance and all very relatable. We appreciate your presentation very much. If anyone has questions, please enter them in the, in the chat. And remember that this presentation, remember a few of those links that Wayne included that will all be on our website, hopefully later this week, like the other presentations in the seminar series. Wayne, I, I just wanna start with, first of all, you know, what an amazing list of, of examples and, and including from a national lab standpoint. So some of our audience always, and part of the focus of our center, as you know, is on scholarship and students. What kind of role can you share that students play in some of these accomplishments? You know, the university and at NCSA, we have this mix of staff, faculty, students working together um, in some academic and applied pursuits. How do students play a role, especially with an AI focus with you? And what have you seen in that time, in your time from how students interacted, I don't know, five years ago to how they might be interacting now? So uh, student engagement is, is a, a key element for um, not so much for staffing support, but we see it as the seed corn for future scientists. So we really do bring in a lot of students uh, and, and that's students at all levels, actually from high school through, uh, through postdoctoral, um, about a thousand a year, I think. Most of those would be summer interns, undergraduates, but not all. You know, as, as I said, a lot of graduate support, postdoctoral support in, in high schools. Um, and they come in, uh, I'll just say, uh, if, if you're interested in working at Lawrence Livermore, go to the uh, LLNL, just search LLNL uh, jobs and you will uh, quickly find uh, the, uh, the, the student uh, opportunities and, and they're all posted. And they're, they're generally quite generic too. So uh, if you don't see uh, your exact expertise written there, just find the closest template to it and apply for that. Um, and and you'll, you could well become one of those uh, thousand to come in every year. Um, they, they come in supporting all of the different programs at the laboratory and that uh, now certainly includes uh, specific activities in data science and machine learning. Um, Particularly for that, we have a fairly new institute called the Data Science Institute, DSI. And again, if you look up DSI at LLNL, you'll find their landing page. Uh, they run uh, workshops and, and seminars and uh, are a good front door for uh, students with interest in working in specifically in data science, uh, uh, sort of uh, agnostic about what uh, technology it's being applied to, that would be a good place there. Um, if your uh, uh, background in, is in a specific technology, say uh, manufacturing or, or drug design, then you might wanna come in through a different pathway focusing specifically on your technology of interest, but combining that with data science. You know, so it's one, one's coming from the left and one's coming from the right. And we do that too. Uh, we recently uh, helped graduate uh, a PhD candidate from RPI who came in with interests in uh, drug design, um, but she ended up uh, her last year really focusing on, on machine learning activities uh, that were uh, supportive of her interests. And she worked on that Cancer Institute example that I gave, the, the, the blue layers with, uh, with, with the jiggly atoms on top. Um, so there, there are many different ways to come in to answer your, to your, answer your question, Brendan. And um, we are fully supportive of, of robust uh, student and academic engagements. And one Wait thing, more, please. Oh, as, as Karen Larson asked a, a related question, if internships 
and student opportunities are for U.S. citizens only or also international students? Um, the answer is it depends. Um, if you're working on an area that might have some, uh, some sensitive information, then uh, depending on how sensitive it is, uh, citizenship requirements could be um, quite strict. Uh, if, it, if it's an open science area and, and uh, computational biology, I say as an example, is, is typically uh, in that area. Um, then uh, international students are generally welcome. A technical question also from Eliezer, it's uh, can you share a little more information on the CNN training signals used to predict the photodiode output in ad additive manufacturing? No, I cannot, but if you'll uh, email me after this, I can put you in touch with the PI who provided those slides to me. Sorry, I'm gonna have and to- Wayne, Wayne uh, give me your, your email and I will put it in the chat. Okay, it is miller99 at llml.gov. Perfect, thank you. Okay, what, uh, about, but, what about your- I can't, I can't say a little bit about that. Um, um, Please. Not, not specifically to answer that question, but um, uh, this team has instrumented uh, these metal powder bed uh, laser fusion manufacturing uh, AM devices uh, with uh, lots of uh, uh, video and, and, and thermal uh, real-time imaging, and that's all recorded. So when a part is created like that arch that we looked at as an example, at the end of it, there is you know, 50 gigabytes of processed data for that one little tiny part that was created, you know, multi-spectral imaging primarily, but also acoustics and, and, and uh, things like uh, laser power uh, sampling along the way. You know, everything, that, everything that goes into it and comes out of it that they can measure gets measured. And so you have this huge data set uh, and, and uh, that needs to be uh, curated appropriately to make it kind of manageable. So it's it's a big data, big, big data problem it is. You know, you talk about, about big data and we've talked about the application side. We only have a, another minute or two, but what about your compute side? I know the national labs are uh, renowned for their investment in high performance computing. At Lawrence Livermore, what does what does that look like? Give it a little bit more background on on your compute resources. Um, they are pretty impressive, I would say. Um, right now, we've got the second biggest computer in the world, and it's the it's the sister of the biggest uh, computer in the world. Um, this this that that's a that is a trophy that, that, that wanders around the globe every year. Somebody has the biggest computer for a while, but we always have one in the top five. Ours is called Sierra and it's, it's, uh, it's an IBM system with uh, two or three NVIDIA GPUs on each node. So it's hybrid right there with CPUs and GPUs. And it is about half an exaflop. And we're expecting to get our first exaflop system in about, a, about two years. We're part of what's called the Exascale Computing Project or program, ECP. That's a Department of Energy uh, program to you know, keep us always in the next biggest computer and driving uh, vendor technology to create that for us. So that's the flagship, but in, around that are, you know, probably a dozen systems at the multi uh, petaflop level. So there's just lots and lots of big supercomputers, some with uh, conventional technology. They all have CPUs, let's say that. About, I'd say everyone that comes in now, every new system that comes in also has uh, GPUs on board every node to support this kind of uh, hybrid uh, uh, data simulation. where you have got data and physics going on. And I'll just say one more thing on that. In the last year, we've worked with two providers of AI specific hardware and created uh, um, uh, test systems that combine 
uh, CPUs and GPUs and these specialized AI chips all running together. So you got three different uh, compute modes in the hardware uh, to solve uh, data intensive problems. And those two companies are Cerebrus and Sambanova. Um, sorry, I don't have that written down for you right now, but uh, you can look those up as well. Um, and, and NVIDIA and Intel and IBM. Intel and IPM would, or and AMD on, on, the, on the CPU side. So there's a real smorgasbord of, of hardware available. Very good, as, as one would expect um, these days. One last question, Mohit, asking on behalf of one of his friends, does additive manufacturing slash metal cutting related research jobs generally open to internationals? Well, uh, I, I would say uh, yes. And I would say uh, you don't need to look just to the national lab. So, you know, sticking with the theme of, of bridging the valley of death, uh, we only are gonna bridge that if there is a catcher's mitt on the other end, which is industry that wants to take this technology and move it out. So for example, we're working very closely with General Electric who manufactures some of these advanced systems for uh, uh, laser fusion of, of metal powder bed and additive manufacturing. And they are one of, of many companies that do that. Uh, and we are one of many national labs that do that. Um, and so, uh, uh, yes, it's certainly open to international students and uh, the, uh, the, the market for those skills, I think is quite broad. A lot of multinational companies involved. So. Yeah. Uh, we are now out of time. I want to thank Wayne Miller, the Deputy Director of HBC Innovation Center at Lawrence Livermore Labs. Wayne, thank you so much for being here. What a great talk. Thank you, everybody, for just spending time with us, the hour. And uh, we will see you next time. Wayne, thanks again. Great, Brandon. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for your time.